Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 82 of the podcast. It's the 26th of July, 2017, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A week. Anne Oman and Anna Brown join me again to answer your questions. Uh, This month, we dig into penmanship and writing, when our past experiences may be clouding our vision, whether some kids may need TV limits, and when your child is feeling bad about themselves. And around here, Michael is back from his trip to New York City to visit Lissy, and by all accounts, they had a great time. They hit the planetarium, Central Park trails, a show with a band he really likes, bookstores, a sunrise on the beach, a sunset on a rooftop, all of his favorite things. And now he's back at work. And I got another chapter of my book done, so yay! <laughs> And thanks to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. A big welcome to new patrons, Christine Goyette and Ionia Necronin. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us, both of you. I deeply appreciate all of my patrons. You guys inspire me, and I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. And if you'd like to support the show, Even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. Now this week, I want to share a quote from the episode, uh, something that Anne said. It's in following your child's light and joy and questions and interests and curiosities and conversations where the learning happens. Now, that's unschooling, all of it right there. And what de-schooling is all about is coming to understand how and why that works. It describes a family's joyful holidays or summer vacation, which is why you'll often hear the suggestion when you start unschooling to treat the next few months like summer vacation, no matter which months they are. Living it is the quickest way to begin to understand it. Follow your child's light and joy and questions and interests and curiosities and conversations and see what happens. It's beautiful. And now, on to your question. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and I'm so happy to be joined again by Ann Oman and Anna Brown. Hi, guys. Yay. Hi. Hi. Here we are. Got our four questions. Would you like to get us started, Anne? I would love to. Our first question is by Anonymous. And uh, she writes, my son just turned seven and we have been unschooling for two years. I love unschooling, but the one little concern that keeps popping up once in a while from my husband is about his writing skills slash penmanship. He struggles writing his name and has no desire to draw. He does the occasional backwards N, and I know that I was dyslexic in my younger years, so I wonder if he may be as well, which is why I don't like to pressure him. Now, I loved drawing but hated reading. He, on the other hand, is an amazing reader well beyond his age. That is what is keeping my husband relaxing about unschooling. So I just want to hear from you of any cases where some children may be natural great readers but had no desire in writing, and once they reached a certain age, they had the desire and picked up writing with ease. At least that's what I'm hoping for. I do plan on sharing this with my husband, so feel free to speak to him directly. Thank you. Well, hello, and hello to your husband, too. I am so happy that you and your husband have given your son and yourselves this incredible gift that is unschooling. What I would like to ask you to do now is rewind a little bit. I'd like you to go back and remember why you chose to unschool. 
Just take a moment and connect with those feelings that allowed you to walk away from sending your child to school and to walk toward allowing him to be free and live and learn in his own way and in his own time. And maybe while you're holding on to those reasons, take a look at that child of yours. Maybe touch your cheek to his and breathe in his wonderfulness. I'm asking you to do this because your question holds school and society expectations and language in it. And I know you're new to unschooling, so this is a natural part of your journey to learning about unschooling and being a student of your child and creating a life that allows him to shine his brightest. So the way that we speak about our children and our lives is a huge part of creating the life we want to live. And it's a huge part of creating that safe, sacred space that allows your child to be who he is and to focus on his joy. Overall, to me, um, it feels like you're looking for a society and school approved reason to trust in your child. And it also feels like perhaps both of you and your husband are holding on to expectations of your son, which are based on the definitions of learning and life that society and school handed to you. Now, again, it's time to go back and look at your then five-year-old son and remember why you did not send him to school. You not only didn't send him to school, you dove right into the wonderful world of unschooling. That is so fabulous. And that right there required a lot of trust. So building that foundation of trust is what you will be working on every time you look at your child and every time your brain tries to define him and put him in that box that school handed to you. I think you need to remember with your heart and your head why you chose not to do that in the first place. So when you say you don't like to pressure him to write because you were dyslexic, in our unschooling lives, there's no pressure whatsoever in coercing our children to do anything. And when you say he's an amazing reader, well beyond his age, in our unschooling lives, we don't ever need to compare our children to the school standard of how well they read or how they are not reading or how well they are writing or not writing. And when you say, at least that's what I'm hoping for, that is an expectation that you have of your child that he should be writing by a certain age. And unschooled children can never truly be free to live and learn in their own way and in their own time when they feel the expectations their parents have for them to be doing something within a time frame. And that's a time frame that makes the parents feel good, really has nothing to do with the child. So when you hope for something in the future of your son, you're missing out on celebrating him for being exactly who he is right now. So all of those things are part of the school mindset and all these things really don't allow unschooling to live easily and flow easily in your home. You're basically, with this mindset, bringing school into your home. Because unschooling is, first and foremost, about trusting our children, no matter what, and not paying attention to or caring where they may fall on the school-defined grading system. Unschooling is about following the child and nurturing and encouraging the things that he loves to do. And with that, there is no lack in unschooling. There's only the abundance of your child's gifts and his joy and everything that makes him shine. And it's in those things, it's in following your child's light and joy and his questions and interests and curiosities and conversations. That's where the learning happens. And that learning will happen in its own time and in its own way, only when the child knows that the parents trust in them and in this path. So now having said all that, we do also see our children's challenges in life. And we, of course, learn from them because we are students of them. And we can see if a challenge is getting in the way of our children's joy. In your case, I'm not sure what you are seeing as your child's challenge in writing is getting in the way of his joy because you're stating that it's a concern of yours and your husband's. Uh, You say he struggles writing his name and has no desire to draw and makes the backwards N. If these things are not getting in the way of doing what he loves to do every day, and if these things are only being highlighted by you and your husband because of the school time frame and expectations, then there's really no need to continue to highlight those things at all in your lives. Again, what needs to be the focus of your everyday lives are the things that your child loves to do. That's what you follow and that's what you trust in. 
Um, I have an essay on my Shine With Unschooling website uh, where I talk about how I assisted my now 27-year-old son when he was younger and having writing challenges. It's actually not an essay. It's an excerpt from one of my conference talks from many years ago, 12 years, I think. Uh, The excerpt is called on my website, I Was His Scribe. So if you could take some time to read that, um, because the important thing to note is that it was my son who was frustrated with the fact that he couldn't write when he really wanted to write. Um, Here's a little excerpt from the excerpt. (laughs) That hurts to say. (laughs) While Jake has always had something to say um, that deserved to be written down, he always found the actual writing to be challenging and difficult. More significant than the fact that he wrote his letters backward, his biggest frustration lay in the fact that what came out of his pencil didn't ever match the picture that was in his head. Because of the high expectations he placed on himself all the time for perfection, the level of frustration that this caused was no small thing in his life. Jake's frustration often blocked his paths to joy and peace, and I knew from his earliest days that this meant that it also blocked his motivation to play with the world. My child's heart wasn't at peace, and so, quite naturally, we came up with a solution. So you see that we came up with a solution to this particular challenge of him wanting to write things down because he was frustrated with himself. He was not feeling good about himself. And it's always been my goal to help my children get to a place where they feel good about themselves. Jacob did want to draw and was frustrated he couldn't. He did want to write and he was frustrated that he couldn't. In this particular story about Jacob, I, as the title says, became his scribe and wrote and typed for him until he didn't want me to do that anymore. Um, I actually have many other stories of solutions that we came up with to help him. If you're on the Shine with Unschooling Yahoo list or want to join, you can search the archives for um, dyslexia or whatever, um, or even the word Sculpey. That's how I found my stories because I've written often about how I got the idea from the book, The Gift of Dyslexia, to have Jacob play with clay to help his brain make the connection between what he wanted to draw or write and what came out of his hand. And here's another excerpt from that conference talk that um, is really important to your questions. I trusted in my child and I made sure joy was our compass. I didn't tell him that he needed to write for himself because I wouldn't always be around to write for him. I didn't shame my child or make him feel less than whole because he struggled with writing. I didn't choose to distance my my child from me by handing him the weight of any disapproval or judgment. Instead, I chose to ignore societies and schools imposed requirements on my child and I focused on the words that his mind and heart were weaving into a story. It's really important to remember that I did not possess the power to see into the future and see my child sitting at the computer writing for himself. I saw in that moment a child who struggled to write, and I chose to trust that all was still well. So this is the place where I'm trying to take you today to have your son's joy be your compass and trust in following that joy to allow the learning to happen in its own time and in its own way. Because the fact that he doesn't want to draw or can't write well matters as little as the fact that you feel he's reading way beyond his age. It doesn't matter. And it can't matter to us at all if we're choosing to not bring school and definitions of learning and its expectations into our home. That's not unschooling. And so I suggest you continue to read all you can about radical unschooling and keep listening to all of Pam's podcasts and continue to make sure your focus is on being a student of your child and nurturing and encouraging and following that which makes him shine. I have one more excerpt from the excerpt. There was a point in the story where Jacob did want to type for himself. I didn't need to share that part though because as I said the trust had to come from that place where I could not see the future and see him eventually writing for himself and so this part of the excerpt is actually when I did a little Snoopy dance of joy because Jacob asked me to get up from the computer chair because he wanted to type himself so I wrote 
I did a Snoopy dance of joy, but not for the fact that my son was finally writing. Just like Sam's journey to reading, the focus was never on the end product of the reading or the writing. No, my heart did a little Snoopy dance of joy because my child had proven yet again that trust is the key element in allowing unschooling to live sweetly in our home. He proved yet again that my children will do what they need or desire to do when they are ready and when it has real meaning in their lives. Okay, that's all of my excerpts, Pam. Do you have- <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was lovely. Um, I uh, what Anne talked about uh, the expectations that she saw inside your question. And I thought that was really cool um, how she brought those out. Um, what I was thinking of doing was diving in and kind of unpacking those expectations uh, that she saw. So maybe a little bit of guidance on how you guys might start to dig into that. Uh, first, I want to mention that I am not sure that it's reasonable to think that those skills will be picked up with ease. In, in the future, right? But when people are interested in figuring something out, like writing, um, that's when their determination will see them through that time and effort of learning and practice to get the competency that, that they're comfortable with, that they're looking for. Remember that point that Anne said, you know, it's all about um, helping him uh, meet his own needs, uh, whether it's with our hands involved or with our support, et cetera. Um, so one of the things I thought it might be worth chatting about with your husband, um, to dig into what's behind his concern around, uh, penmanship, um, is, is to try, trying to figure that out, um, whether or not it's a communication thing. Okay. Uh, so is he more concerned, uh, that he won't be able to communicate in the future because he can't, uh, write things down. So you can talk about, uh how much of our communication nowadays has moved beyond handwriting to typing and to speaking like through videos and audio. So teasing out the difference between communication or writing skills, you know, as Anne was talking about on the computer and penmanship might help him, your husband feel more comfortable. And I have a blog post about that, that I'll link to in the show notes for you to look at. Um, If it actually is about, penmanship. Maybe you guys can chat about the wide range of skills in the adults, you know, to tease out his expectations around that. Are they really realistic? Because hard to read handwriting isn't a sign of lack of intelligence. Um, And I bet that the people that you guys know with, quote, bad handwriting, they likely all went to school. So it's not so much an unschooling thing, but a human thing, right? Some of us have neater handwriting than others. Um, forcing handwriting practice will come with all the challenges of forcing anything, you know, namely building up that frustration and resistance and feeling judged and shame. Um, that doesn't mean ignoring it. You know what I mean? Like as, as I mentioned, this is all part of your days. It means seeing things through his eyes and bringing your uh, wishes and needs into it as well. So if you and your husband truly value handwriting, you guys will be writing, right? It will be part of your lives. You can write your son notes by hand. You can use, use it as a communication tool in your family, you know, show him how you use um, that skill. Just don't insist that, that he do the same, that he join you. You're just showing the usefulness of it to him. If that's uh, something that's important to you guys. And when your son sees value in it, um, he may well become interested in writing by hand more often and his skill will develop over time. So I think that's one of the, the biggest things Um, as Anne mentioned, is seeing things from your son's perspective, seeing what he's looking for, if this is an issue for him, digging into the expectations with your husband so you can also help him um, realize where this expectation for penmanship or writing skills, whichever one it is, and even teasing out the difference between them and helping him work through it as well. And if it's something you guys want to have more of in your lives, you and your husband can start bringing that in more. That makes sense. How about you, Anna? 
Um, yeah, so I think handwriting is one of those really interesting things that people worry a lot about for children, and you hear a lot of talk about it, and yet the world is filled with adults who attended school who pretty much have illegible handwriting. <laughs> and, you know, I worked in a hospital when I was younger, and and it, it's a stereotype, but I'm telling you it's true. <laughs> the doctor's handwriting was the absolute worst, and it was we would just spend – hours trying to crack what were they trying to say <laughs> it's like wait let's pass it with this other thing we've seen so i think it really helps to realize that perfect penmanship doesn't really mean anything except that someone enjoys writing um my youngest decided that she wanted better handwriting and she proceeded to fill tons of paper with practice writing because that was something she was interested in and she likes her handwriting now um, my oldest has some motor skill issues and handwriting really never came easy for her and you know when she's in a situation of using it more it it improves but it's not a priority for her she's noted that that when she does do it more her handwriting improves but she just really doesn't care um you know i have decent handwriting my ha husband not so much um it just isn't really something people worry about with adults so i think you know at pam spoke about this too i think it's just really important to kind of look at that bigger picture and and just like Pam said too in our current age being comfortable typing is probably a much more used skill and I would imagine some would even argue texting with your thumbs is more important um, you know not to mention voice to text technology and you know there's just so many options now and I feel like your child's going to find what works for him in terms of handwriting and communication and getting his ideas on paper or communicated to another person and handwriting may become an interest at some point or he may just do enough to get by like my daughter who knows how to sign her name or fill out a form when she needs to but it just isn't something that interests her um you know and i feel like just giving things time and stepping back and observing you know seven is really very young there's plenty of time for all kinds of things to unfold around this interest or the things that they're doing and I would remind yourself that sending him to school wouldn't make handwriting an interest but allowing him time to approach it as he wants to and needs to will foster a much healthier relationship and I think that goes back to all the things that Anne was talking about about just really connecting with him and seeing his joy and not putting these outside expectations on him and I think when we step back and look at where are those coming from where are these voices what is this you know belief we have that it has to look like this you know when we can peel back those layers it's really so easy to then shed that stuff and focus on the relationship you have with your child and so I would really that's what all I have to say but like all those things that we've said together I think really hopefully will make you both feel better I, I'd like to add one more thing. Um, I was remembering when Jacob was little and he used to make his Nugget comic strip. It was a uh, Nugget was um, my other son's guinea pig. And um, Jacob's writing, um, you know, with dyslexia and every traits and everything um, was not legible often and he would bring me his comic strip that he made you know so excited to have me read it and um sometimes i couldn't read what the word said so i'd say what's that say jake and he would that's not the response that he wanted he wanted to bring me his um comic strip and have me read it and then react to the comic strip so he did, wouldn't even want to tell me what it said he would take it back he would understand that i couldn't read his handwriting so he would take it back and he would erase it and he would put more effort into writing more clearly and then he would bring it to me again and usually I'd be able to read it but what's really important about the story I think is to make sure that we redefine um, what comprises success in conveying a message by way of the written word so um, your son is making ends backward. Jacob had, you know, the spelling was creative spelling. Letters were backwards and everything. And yet I was able to read and understand what he was conveying. And so that was it. Mm -hmm. I did, you know, I didn't say this is backwards. This is spelled wrong and everything. And that, again, would have crushed him again and probably discouraged him from ever wanting to show me his comic strip 
work again. So, uh, you know, if, if, he, if I can read it and his, he was successful in conveying what he wanted to say, that was enough. That was fantastic. So. Okay, I, I think I'll pop in. Because <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I completely forgot about this when I was answering the question because it was a long time ago. But <laughs> you, rem- you reminded me with that story, Anne. So uh, writing was actually one of our big tweaks along the journey while my kids were in school um, to me finding unschooling because my eldest uh, was, I guess this was the beginning of grade four. He went to school. Uh, first week, he did a worksheet. His teacher took his worksheet, said, this is too messy, and erased it all in front of him and told him to do it again. And from that moment on, he refused to write for her. Mm-hmm. He did not write another letter mm-hmm. in her class because of that. And so she had to, uh, I mean, he didn't stay in that class very long. <laughs> Um, yeah. but that, I just wanted to say that that's an example, even in school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So school isn't your solution. Well, that's it. And, and it's, we're talking about keeping the child's spirit whole again, you know, okay. keeping themselves whole and school will do what they can to not do that, you know, yeah. <laughs> make Even sure the writing, like- the writing is absolutely perfect. And I, same with typing. I mean, I always said that typing was the only thing I really learned from school. And, you know, that's in a typing class where the, your hands go in the right place, your fingers go to the right letters. And yet my kids, again, prove that to not even be true because they type so fast in in any way they want to. And so I have these memories of being told, you know, how to sit, how to hold my hands, and they just type. And, you know, mm-hmm. so it's it's yeah. keeping, just keeping them whole. Yeah. And uh, when Joseph wanted to, uh, so the first, so the first year home after they left school, um, you know, we didn't ask him to write at all. I remember it was about a year later, he picked up the pencil for the first time and and wrote something. And he's like, Hey, I don't think I've done that in like a year. And it was just a cool observation, you know, because there was zero pressure anymore for him to have to do that. And, but Somewhere in those uh, in that year, at one point he wanted to participate in an online game. <coughs> Excuse me, and he was typing fluently in a couple mm-hmm. of weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I guess we should go on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Maybe chat so. more about this. <laughs> okay, so I have a question to you from Nikki in Ontario, Canada. Eh? <laughs> yeah. um, Hello, Pam, Ann, and Anna. Prepare yourself because I'm about to gush. Thank you so much for your time and wisdom and knowledge and for sharing your experiences. I absolutely love your podcast, Pam, and your books and website. What incredible resources. I'm especially... I especially love the Q&A episodes, which are so rich with insight and love. All of your support has been pivotal in my unschooling journey. So much gratitude. Okay, some background first before I ask my question. I have three daughters, eight, six, and four, all of which have never been to school. I was a teacher for 10 years, and to quote Sandra Dodd, I was, quote, made of school. After the birth of my third daughter, I decided to leave the teaching profession to be unschooled by the experience of unschooling. I have been de-schooling myself for the last four to five years soaking up all kinds of unschooling and life experiences and resources honestly millions of unschooling books articles every podcast on unschooling ever recorded haha ha, quite seriously and i still feel like i have a lot of work to do but i'm so passionate about this way of living and it has begun an incredible journey for me especially, of changing paradigms in my life. My girls and I have incredible relationships and they are very bonded to each other as well. I deeply believe in what we are doing and I am aware I still get pulled back into my old ways. I continue to examine new perspectives and have been paying attention to things that make me uncomfortable as I'm learning that things that make me uncomfortable are things that I can look deeper at, unpack and examine. We have a wonderful small community of unschooling families who we have bonded with over the past four years and there are many children of all ages who play together and it's incredible to witness. 
We also see many friends who are not unschoolers. I find that the times I feel uncomfortable in these social situations is when someone feels left out or when a child seems to be in, to intentionally be not included in some sort of play. The reporting of this usually comes from my six-year-old who is quite sensitive, but also happens with my four-year-old with her own sisters at home or four other kids as well. Situations like these, and they seem to happen a lot, really get to me. I feel fiercely protective of the one who's being left out and my initial instinct is to want to stand up for them and help them be heard. I'm aware where this uncomfortableness and strong reaction comes from. I had an overall horrible, very damaging experience throughout all of grade school and was bullied very badly and excluded from many things. I hated school and never wanted to go mainly because of the social aspect. These are things I'm examining through therapy and have been deeply scarred by, but still struggle with in my own social circle as a 36 year old woman. It has deeply affected my self-confidence and sadly has shaped me in many ways, not all sadly, because it has contributed to many wonderful qualities of mine, like my empathetic nature and sensitive superpowers. I am aware these experiences often creep into my experience now as a mother. They crept into my experience as a teacher, as I had a hard time navigating the social atmosphere of school as a teacher, I truly despised it. When it is brought to my attention, either by observation or from my child, I listen to my daughter's concerns. I'm truly empathetic. I suggest things that she can say or do. I'm not really sure what she should do sometimes, or if it persists, I go over to the situation with her to be present and I attempt to mediate, but usually end up trying to resolve it. This doesn't feel right, and I'm very emotionally charged when this happens. I struggle to remain neutral. I'm even close to or in tears after when I discuss it with my husband trying to get his perspective. I'm afraid I get too involved and am making a big deal of it. I know her experience is not my experience, but it's so hard to separate in the moment. I am continuing to work on that. I'm looking for suggestions on how to handle these experiences better for my daughters. I think my perspective is so clouded with my school experience as a child and a teacher that I'm missing an opportunity to grow from it and support my daughters through these social experiences. And I resting this from a schoolish perspective still. I need some outside perspective, much appreciated. Oh, Nikki, <laughs> I hear you. And I just, I don't know, I just want to hold that space for all that child that you were and how difficult that time was for you and how it's still something that you're processing. And I think we all have a bit of that in our lives. Um, you know, I feel like sometimes these social situations can be tough to navigate for all of us. I too am sensitive to a child that's being left out. I have to watch my triggers and make sure that I'm not reacting from that place. What I like about unschooling and our homeschooling community is that there's more flexibility to find the right fit and ebb and flow with the feelings. The forced daily aspect of school really intensifies social situations and doesn't leave much room for the individual. Sometimes I think it's helpful to look at the energy of the children involved. We found big groups, even of close friends, didn't work for my oldest. She needed more one-on-one -on -one interactions to shine. The big group energy didn't work, and she had a hard time finding people with whom she clicked. For others, even my youngest at times, the big group energy was great. She likes to observe, but feels comfortable in that group energy. So realizing it doesn't have to be about one side or the other being right or wrong, but finding solutions and situations that help your child connect and shine can be helpful. I'm not clear if it's your daughter who's feeling left out or if she's noticing another. If it's noticing another, I would talk to my girls about ways to include someone who is off to the side, realizing that they might be looking for a more quiet connection or conversation so they could approach them in that way. Other times the person just wants to be, it wants an invitation and then they'll hop right in. That was easy enough to solve. So I would connect with the kids involved and try to get a read on what's going on without putting it through your school filter, if at all possible. You know, seeing is it a situational issue? Does the child that's being left out really just have a hard time negotiating big groups and needs a different environment? If it's your child, perhaps you would be better served by smaller groups or friends coming over or that type of thing. And so look at it again. It's separating it from the this right or wrong. It's this one situation of you know being bullied or not included into what works for the children involved what what can you do to kind of cre help cr them create that environment and i do want to take just a moment to say 
um, that sometimes things can go off track and you may witness behavior that is hurtful to another child. Um, I feel very comfortable stepping in and making sure that any hurtful behavior is stopped and that we try to figure out a way to move forward caring for everyone's needs. Kids come to group events with all kinds of experiences and feelings. If one is lashing out against another and even trying to get others to go along, that's the time we can share information and help the child being targeted feel heard and protected. We may not be able to change the child's behavior, but we can show the child who is hurting that they are important and heard and show the other children witnessing how we can be compassionate and inclusive. Providing information and feedback helps them navigate the tricky waters. And I try to keep in mind that the child who is exhibiting bullying behaviors is often hurt or reflecting something that has happened to him or her. So finding a way to connect and recenter everyone can be really helpful. So that went off on a bit of a tangent, but the whole playground dynamics got me thinking. And I think it is something that, you know, as parents, we run across when we're in those larger environments. So anyway, I will pass on to Anne. Well, that tangent gave me goosebumps and made me tear up. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, hi, Nikki. We all touched upon this topic um, with a similar question in podcast episode 69 with Tracy's question. So you might want to listen to that if you haven't already or if you have listened to it again. Um, and I know you want help in handling these situations, but I'm going to back up and review even attending just like Anna did. Uh, in our family, we've always been proactive. We rarely got together in group settings because they just didn't work well for any of us. We all prefer home and we prefer getting together with maybe one family at a time, maybe two. Um, my youngest son, Sam, is the most extroverted of a family of introverts. <laughs> and so we'd always have conversations about what we could do to make sure everyone's social needs and desires were being met, making sure that we chose things that allowed allowed everyone to be happy. So there were rare occasions when we all would choose to go ahead and attend a group gathering. And for those times, we would talk ahead of time about what we would do if a challenge arose, if a situation might come up where children were playing together and one was feeling bad, we would talk about maybe what we wanted to bring so that I or, or my husband and I could continue to have fun with the child who didn't want to be with the kids anymore. And because we would have a plan in place that allowed our kids to walk away from a situation where they were uncomfortable or feeling like they were left out and allow them to look forward to shifting to doing whatever it was that we brought to do together. Um, we've always called this process briefing and debriefing. The briefing happens before we go to be in a group setting. Like I said, we talk about what we do if a challenge came up. We talk about maybe how long we thought we might want to stay. We talk about who was going to be there and if any, if my children had anything to talk about concerning any person who was going to be there or anything. So we always went into group situations with information and knowledge and really most importantly, a solid foundation that we built from our connection with each other with these briefings. And that's what made us feel good and confident, <laughs> knowing that we were stepping out of our vehicle really happily and joyfully connected for having had that briefing. And we would know how to go forward in most any situation. Also, my children knew that my husband and I would rather be playing with our kids than talking to the adult. <laughs> so they, they knew that there was no kind of separation in that way. We were always swirling in and out of each other's spaces. Um, if my kids were off having fun with others for an extended amount of time, my husband and I would go to them and connect with them. My oldest um, tend to be the one who would start to feel overwhelmed and anxious. So we would always go to him with some water and connect with him. We'd be so happy to see him, talk to him about what he's playing, touch him in some way. That was really important. Maybe rub his back a little, uh, offer him a drink of water. And all of these things would help ground and center him and our presence and connection helped him to connect with himself so he could stop the swirlingness of play that he tended to lose himself in and he could see if he wanted to keep going with the play or maybe shift to something else something with us 
Um, but my children have always felt best when we got together with friends individually and in our own home, actually. In this way, we were the ones who created the energy and the atmosphere and planned the play or activities. This always flowed much better for us because we created the play experience that my children wanted to have. And this is a really good example of what I mean when I so often say that we create our wonderful unschooling lives. In this small example, we, being students of our children and knowing in which environments they shine, go forward with exactly that, creating the play space and gatherings to make sure that my children and their friends have a positive experience. And anytime we follow that which allows our children to shine, it is a win-win for everyone because it allows space for just the right people to come into our lives. By removing something that was causing pain and anxiety the way group gatherings did for my children, we found other ways to satisfy their social desires. And again, they would both just shine. And those who also preferred to gather with just a family or two would gravitate toward us. And we you know, ended up being people of similar energies um, and enjoyed spending time together. So as far as your perspective based on your own childhood experiences, I so hear you. I so get what you're saying. I was the same way. And yet that doesn't belong anywhere near my in my children's lives. That is my story. And I can choose to carry that around or not. And I most certainly don't want to hand that to my children because that's our focus, the children and their stories that they're writing and living. So we take each situation in our lives as they are when they arise, and we don't hand that situation any extra weight from our own experiences. We walk forward toward those things that allow them to shine. We walk away from those things that bring about bad feelings. Or we talk about those things that bring bad feelings and decide what the children want to do. Oh, oh my God, that's part of the debriefing. I just realized I didn't talk about the debriefing part of the briefing and debriefing. <laughs> After a social <laughs> gathering of any kind, once it was over and we were in the car on the way home, or after our guests left our house, we would talk about how everyone was feeling, how they thought it went. And so that created this, again, the sacred space to talk about anything, something maybe someone said that didn't feel good to a child about what they thought was fantastic or, you know, in a situation of bullying happening um, or what was really wonderful and what they thought worked and would like to do again. So that the debriefing gives us more information and insight to go forward toward our next decision, whether or not to accept a group gathering invitation. So, you know, we'd all kind of know ourselves better for having these briefing and debriefing conversations. And uh, that's how you fine tune what works for you and your family. Um, and that's, we come to what feels really good and right for all of us from doing that. Pam? Thank you. And thank you so much for your beautiful enthusiasm, Nikki. That was awesome. <laughs> it's it's so lovely to know that you uh, find my books, website, and podcasts helpful, and especially these Q&A episodes, because <clears throat> I love that Anna and Anna, Anne and Anna, so graciously give their time to answer questions with me. So thank you, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to get to the question, uh, it is, it's wonderful that, uh, you're working so hard, Nikki, to tease out how much of this might be your childhood experiences filtering, um, how you interpret what you're seeing and that will take some time. So keep at it. I know Anne talks about, you know, choosing not to do it. So it's being patient with yourself while actively finding your way to that choice. So what I thought I'd do is share um, some things that I've done before in similar situations in case that might spark some ideas for you. Um, and as always, I mean, for me, this is always where I go when anything comes up. So when I'm worried about being too involved in a situation, I look to my kids, right? So there were times when they wanted me to be more involved than I was comfortable being, but knowing that they wanted me there beside them gave me that extra bit of courage to get or stay involved. 
And then there was other times where I could tell that they wanted less of my involvement. So I found ways to keep myself otherwise occupied and would just keep an eye on things to see if they changed their minds or if things were escalating. But again, within that zone, I also considered my own comfort level. And this is where you're doing your work um, to, to tease out what uh, is in reaction to your school experiences. So if I got to a place, if things got to a place um, where I was not comfortable with what was happening, I would try and find ways to diffuse things. So meaning rather than trying to step in and ask the kids involved to change their behavior or to take over and try and solve it for them, I would try to actively be involved in the play and just be an example of another way to approach the situation. I think Anna touched on that as well. So if things seem to be getting heated in a game, I'd ask if I could join in because pretty often the kids were happy to have an adult play with them. Um, and sometimes the answer was, well, when this round's done, you can play with us in the next round. That gave me a good reason to hang around and wait uh, until they, they finished up the next one. And especially when school kids are involved, having an adult around helps temper their behavior. Um, or if I thought there a child was feeling left out and was unhappy about it, you know, um, instead of going up and asking the other kids to play with them and getting caught up in that tug of war of trying to um, bring them together, I'd offer something up to the only child. Hey, you want to go kick a ball around? Would you like me to push on the swing? You want to come in and get a freezy? You know, if, if there were some kids playing at my house. Uh, something that I thought they, that individual child might genuinely enjoy. Um, so now they're having fun and they aren't feeling so left out. And you know, it happens sometimes the other kids would see what fun thing we were doing and they would all come and join us and it would be a way to bring the group back together. Sometimes as we chatted, the child would mention wanting to join the other kids and I would help them figure out a way that that might work. Oh, you know, what was it that uh, you didn't like about what they were playing or why are you not playing right now and, and helping them um, find ways that they might be able to mesh that play back together. Um, and, and I can also validate them at that point, right? If, if it was something that they didn't want to play, I could, you know, I can see why you wouldn't like that game. When I was young, I didn't like to play hide and seek. I really didn't like to play hide and seek <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, whatever it was, you know, you can have a conversation with them. Uh, maybe I'd ask what game they'd like to play with the other kids, uh, when that was done. And I could help then facilitate a transition when one game was done into the next one. So I figured out a way that I could feel more comfortable in this situation without blaming the other kids or creating a big scene out of it just by being an example of ways to move through that kind of situation for next time. Um, so often I found that it was just a mismatch of who wants to do what in that moment, right? Or, or somebody just feeling off kilter and needing some one-on-one -on -one time to ground. So I would have to be that one-on-one -on -one time with them. As, you know, as Anne mentioned, they would go up to Jake and, and, you know, just spend a little bit of time with him to ground him just to see where he was. And, you know, so often, as I said, I mean, around here, we didn't have a lot. We didn't have any local unschooling families. Right. So our local play with kids was with school kids and often their parents aren't paying attention either. So I could also help things, the whole thing go more smoothly just by grounding and connecting with a kid who was um, feeling uncomfortable, feeling left out or starting to get over exuberant, you know, when you could mm -hmm. see the energy getting too much for the group. Hey, would you like to come get a freezy or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And as uh, Anne mentioned, the debriefing, that's a huge thing. Um, so after I would chat with my kids, I would tell them what I saw, what I did, why I did that, see what their take was, you know, because their perspective is different. They, they would have a, a, another interesting insight to bring into the whole thing. And then we'd all bounce around ideas for next time. Um, things that I could do, things that they could do, you know, and just getting to know those other kids better under, we would all understand the other kids better and be able to help them as well. Because my goal when I was part of that uh, group situation with kids was just to try and help everyone have fun. Not putting expectations on the other kids to make it happen. I could be part of 
part of the whole thing and try to help make it happen on my own without any expectations on others. Okay. Can I can I can I bloop yeah. bloop in here? <laughs> you bloop on in. <laughs> I'm so happy you expanded on on that on because that's that's so good. All of your little methods and stuff. That's what we would do also, and it's so hard to fit in. So I'm so glad you said all that. And the main point is also when you said you know, kids are happy to have an adult join them when they're as fun adults as we are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say something at the moment. Moment, I'm like, okay, just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so funny because yesterday, Dave and I were sitting in the river and I just, I, I don't know what I was thinking about, but I said out loud to him, be the fun that you want to have. <laughs> I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, that's my new thing, you know? So, but I mean, that's exactly it because um, that's uh, what we do. We are the parents that the kids get excited about uh, seeing and joining in. And because we're searching for the positive uh, answer to everything. You know what I mean? And 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 ad- admitting, like Pam said, if it's not working out, oh, yeah, I can see why you wouldn't want to do that. You don't like that kind of thing. You know, you don't like to finger paint, whatever. So um, I, I just, I loved all your details and, and needed to ins- in, instill my new quote there. <laughs> I love that new quote uh, so, so much. And I also, like, I think it's good to, to know yourself. So like, I'm not great with big groups. So sometimes like me, I would probably not push myself in the middle of a lot of kids, but I definitely can be that person that connects, like, let's go get the freezy and loves to talk and chat and then, you know, can be in, in, in fun in that environment. So I think it's just knowing, you know, how you can relate best and where you can, you know, kind of help that energy overall. And so I exactly. love that. I am exactly. going to and I love the it. fun that I want to have. <laughs> Yeah. And I loved it, Pam, when you said, like, um, like I talked about, we would bring stuff to do with our kids and that would always um, attract other kids. Yes. The other day, Dave and I were at a, a restaurant that had a, a balcony and this gorgeous yard and there were these two little girls playing. And I said to Dave, um, we always used to bring stuff for the kids to play with. And yeah. we used to have that ball that had the long tail. It was called a foxtail. And wherever we went, if it was a park or whatever, you know, I always had that with me and we'd always bring out the foxtail and everybody was always so drawn to that and everybody wanted to join in. So, you know, that's the, again, be the fun that you want to have, carry around the thing that you want to do and it attracts other people that, you know, want to be a part of it. So I love it. And it just shifts the energy, right? Because when things are starting to get out of sorts, it's usually an energy thing. So if you can shift the focus and the energy, you can bring it all back and it just kind of gets a fresh start for everyone, right? And it doesn't have to be about, you know, solving the problem or, you know, forcing forcing the thing. So for me, it's like I might bring coloring pages or have art supplies over on the side. And sometimes it's those quiet children that are feeling left out, but really they don't even want to be in the big thing. They might enjoy that and like you said then it draws new people and then you have this group of people that are enjoying that same energy level of connecting over this quiet environment so it's just i think of all those different pieces it's just a much more positive approach than okay i'm going to go in and i'm going to solve them and make sure they're including somebody and they're doing it this way and that way you know yeah it reminds me of you know winter time when we're in our small house for so long and jake and sam started to get on each other's nerves you know instead of sitting down saying oh my god what's the issue here i'd say hey guys let's go outside you know what i mean (laughs) it's a change of scenery it's a change of energy and it just it starts everything anew so very cool okay question number three is from sarah in italy she writes uh, i've recently taken away all limits around tv for my five and a half year old daughter previously she was watching around two hours a day although we were fairly flexible since taking away the limits she is pretty much watching tv all day she'll stop only if we're going out somewhere or if a friend comes to play I know this is normal in the beginning. However, I'm uncomfortable with how much she is watching. She is incredibly bright. I suspect gifted, although she has never been tested. She is a perfectionist, has low tolerance of frustration and sensory issues. I'm worried she is using TV as an escape from all that to avoid situations that are frustrating or uncomfortable for her. Whilst this is okay some of the time, I question whether it's good for her to watch so much. So my question is, are there situations where certain children may need limits around screens? 
Thanks so much for your question, Sarah. And the short answer is no, I don't think there are certain kinds of children that need imposed limits on TV watching. But really, there is so much more to it. It's not a yes, no, limit them or leave them be kind of question. There's a whole world of things to do in between those choices. So you you mentioned that you suspect she may be watching TV rather than confronting situations that are frustrating or uncomfortable for her right now. And that's okay. It's great even. She's exploring ways to care for herself, maybe cocooning until she feels ready to step back out into those kinds of situations. So dive in and help her. Give her tons of love and support so she can experience the most awesome cocooning time ever. So, you know, lots of blankets, pillows, snacks, drinks, hang out with her so she's not alone. She can see and feel your active support. And maybe she'll enjoy playing some games with you or chatting as the TV plays in the background. Over time and lots of conversations, if she's feeling frustrated or stressed about something, it'll probably come up at some point and you guys will be able to chat about it. And then again, maybe she's not avoiding things. Maybe she's really enjoying what she's watching. Mm -hmm. But again, by hanging out with her, you'll discover what she's watching, what she's enjoying about the shows. You'll know enough detail about them to have a real conversation with her about them. Not just a perfunctory, you know, oh, that was funny. Ha ha ha. Maybe she is figuring out some really cool stuff about people or animals or whatever. You're going to discover what's so fascinating for her. Because the interest isn't likely the TV itself. It's whatever thoughts and ideas she's able to engage with through the medium of TV. So whether or not she's using TV as a way to escape from challenges, I think that by hanging out with her while she's watching, you're going to learn so much more about her and be better able to help her move forward than you would be if you just start putting limits on it. So see again, back to the kids. What are they experiencing? See what they're doing. See what they're feeling through their perspective, through their eyes, instead of through ours. Anna? Mm -hmm. I mean, just like Pam said, I think finding ways to connect with this interest of her would really help bring the two of you together. I don't, I also, the short answer is no, but I don't think that people in general are served by others limiting them. I think we can decide about limiting something for ourselves, but when it's an imposed, it changes the dynamics of the relationship to the person who's imposing and also to the activity or the item that's being limited, sometimes making it more attractive or, you know, a reaction to go towards versus, you know, kind of bubbling up organically. So I'm just very cautious about any kind of outside limits because I know that I don't like people doing that to me. Um, as you mentioned, it's very common for a bounce back after limitations because they're testing and wondering if this is going to last. And if it's not going to last, I'm going to get it all in. I'm going to do as much as I can. <laughs> And only when they begin to trust that the limits are gone for good can they walk away, knowing that they can come back whenever they're ready. And it really takes that power away. Um, and as we've cautioned here before, and I know there's other Q&As and other whole podcasts, really, the word screens is not representative of what is happening, even when we're talking about TV, what shows are she watching? What does she love about them? And just like Pam said, what ideas are being sparked? What, what draws her to it? You know, talk to her, watch with her, find things that relate to the shows to share with her. Our lives have been really enriched by the shows we've watched and the books we've read, sending us down incredibly fun rabbit trails into all kinds of, you know, interesting places. And I think it's always fun for this situation to ask yourself, if she were reading all day, would your reaction be the same? Because reading is an escape, but we tend to value it differently. And if we just look at things like computers, TVs, books, magazines as tools, it really changes the charged energy that we hold around it. They're equal tools that serve different purposes at different times. And then that can really change, again, that charged energy. And. Um, the difference in your energy between completely joining her um, and 
because you're interested in who she is, because you love her, she's your daughter, and you want to know what makes her mind work, you want to know what lights her up, and versus standing back and saying, oh, oh, I'm feeling tense, she's watching TV all the time. I mean, can you see that she feels the difference there? And she's... Uh, if you are judging it from afar, then that is going to make her feel like it is going to be taken away. That is not the best way to allow uh, her to build trust in you and to connect with her and have your relationship be where you want it to be as an unschooling family. So uh, that's I just uh, second everything they said about joining her in her wonderful space and seeing the value and most of all focusing on your relationship. And yeah, I, I think, I you just know, want to say, cause I, I, and I love what Anne added there. And I think it's a tool that the three of us use a lot, which is just, how does that feel? You know, how, when we're is some, going into something, it, that energy that Anne's talking about, that feeling of connecting with your child, follow that feeling of joy and connection. And, and it really does lead you <laughs> to this relationship and all of this, this stuff that we're talking about. And I think it's just a tool that we kind of use unconsciously. And maybe it, I just loved how she said it out loud in that way. <laughs> I think that was helpful. <laughs> Yeah, and the other piece that, that jumped out for me from what you said, Anne, was uh, being curious about our kids. I mean, to me, that was something that I could just always go back to. If I didn't understand something or I was, you know, a bit uncomfortable or what's going on here, it was what was always overriding was that feeling of curiosity about how that how my child saw it because I knew they were making choices and doing things um, that made sense to them right and that they were enjoying doing so I always my always basic assumption was always that I was missing something not that mm -hmm. they were missing something right 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 and so being curious and trying to figure that out and and spending time with them and and seeing what it was all about from their perspective there was not once, and now my kids are all, they're all 20 and older, there was not once where um, that was the wrong move. I always, exactly. uh, things always worked out better mm -hmm. and always worked out well when I uh, gave that trust and then followed my own curiosity about them. Right. And I, uh, like I've described it in talks before about um, they're in the driver's seat and we're along for this wonderful ride, you know, that expands our world, even just, even if it's something that we know, we're seeing it from a different perspective because our parents probably were there. You know, I know my mother used to get mad when we would watch TV too much and she'd start vacuuming around us and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, to uh, dive in and just go with the joy and the connection is a really wonderful thing. Okay, so question four is from Anonymous again, and well, different Anonymous, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, she writes, I've been homeschooling for 12 years. I have four kids. We have tried many different things. My oldest is, my oldest will be 17 tomorrow. I discovered quickly back in kindergarten that school at home didn't work. We have always been relaxed, but not true unschooling. I've been reading and listening to your podcast. So a couple of fears that I would love others pursue perspective on our number one we have friends who homeschool and they are definitely school at home the mom was a public school teacher so my 12 year old gets upset that she doesn't know things that her friends know she still struggles with multiplication and most all math so how do you handle or help your kids with issues like this i keep telling her she will get it not to worry she embarrassed she is embarrassed by that and feels behind Number two, I know in unschooling, you don't worry if they read really late, according to society. What if something happened to the mom and the kids had no choice but to go to public school? I would be so worried how they would make it. Hello. I am so glad you're learning about radical unschooling by listening to Pam's podcast. And I so appreciate you asking about the things that bring up some fear in you. That is perfect to bring it up. Um, with your question number one, uh, I'm feeling like if you really want to give this unschooling life a chance, um, you may want to examine who you're choosing to surround your children with. 
um, a school at home family might with a former teacher may not be the most supportive people at this point in your journey. And as my response to Nikki in question two, um, you can see that it's our job as unschooling parents to actively create the world that allows our children to thrive and shine. And because I spoke, uh, as I spoke of in question one, our language and mindset matter so much in creating an environment in which unschooling can flow beautifully. Uh, I think it's important to separate ourselves from the definitions and expectations that society and school impose on our children at all. So what your daughter is feeling actually does come up in unschooled children occasionally as well. But I feel like because you're so new to unschooling, um, it's important to simply focus on the things that your children love to do, the things that bring them such joy and the things that allow them to feel so good about themselves. Um, because that remo complete removal of the school mindset from your lives um, I said before that the school system is successful in one thing, and that's making our children feel less than whole. So when the focus is uh, getting them to a place where they know that they are perfectly wonderful as they are, with no school definitions anywhere near your lives, that's the place where you want to be. And you do that by celebrating them for being exactly who they are and nurturing and encouraging everything that makes them light up and filling your space with their shine uh, so that it almost feels like there's no space for them to feel less than whole in there. Um, and even separating math out of life and making it a subject uh, that your daughter feels she's not good at is making her feel less than whole. Because uh, here's what math has looked like in our rather cool unschooling home. There was never any test to measure or to even know if a child struggled with math or not. It, math was simply a part of our lives. Any math that needed to be done was most likely a part of a conversation or a project or something else that we were doing. And we would just discuss the math portion of life just as easily and uh, flowingly as we discussed anything and everything else. Uh, if my child needed to know some answer to a math issue, I would give them an answer or we'd use a calculator together or we'd discuss how to get that answer because maybe I wouldn't even know how to do it and we'd have to look it up. And if they asked how to do something, I would show them, or again, we'd look it up. For a few years, we volunteered at our local fair trade store, and my kids would love being in this completely different space. And they used to love joining me behind the checkout counter, and they would play with all the calculators back there. And I remember them asking once what the square root symbol on the calculator button was, and then they proceeded to make up their own square root games. And... Uh, you know, also, my children and their wonderful, free, always unschooled brains, uh, they always used math methods that were far better than anything I was ever taught in school anyway. I remember sh when I showed them the process of multiplying once, you know, like, say, 35 times 5, you're like, okay, 5 times 5 is 25, write down the 5, carry the 2. They thought that was the most bizarre thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> they could always do math in their heads in their own way and come up with the right answer in their own way. And I would just be in awe. And, you know, they were right that the method I learned in school was bizarre. Not only the method itself, but definitely the fact that school students are told that this is the way you have to do math. You know how we always had to show our work to make sure we did it the way they told us to do it and no other way. When math is just a part of life, honestly, like buttering toast or turning on the TV or sharpening a pencil or doing a craft, there's no test, no measure, really no focus on any lack at all. The focus is, as always, on life and ease and flow and connection. And that is where the learning happens. So an unschooling um, child's life is so very rich and full of things that they do know that they do love. So that's what you want to fill their lives with. And again, maybe not so much with a family, with a mom who was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do want to continue to get together with these friends, you know, maybe do some things like I suggested in Nikki's question that we all suggested, being proactive with briefing and debriefing. Bring along an activity or craft or game that your daughter loves that allows her to shine and be with her, guiding the energy and flow of maybe not the entire gathering, but at least her space at the gathering. 
time. So there's not space for her to feel bad about herself. So she can feel like she is shining, uh, you know, and doing what she loves even there. Uh, we used to, when we would go to my in-laws house for dinner, I would write down things to talk about that the kids were doing to keep the conversation flowing toward, you know, toward the things that m made my kids light up and uh, adults gravitate toward that so easily. Um, you know, because they love to do things in their lives too, but sometimes all they have are school questions for kids. So um, that's another good thing to do. But also, um, you know, she needs to feel like she's shining, especially in your eyes. And so that's why it's important that you're the guide and creator of the, sp of the space that allows her to feel that way. And your question number two, I, I feel you so much. I feel that fear. And a lot of people do have that fear. Uh, the answer is that simple for me. Also, I choose to not live in that fear. And I especially don't live in the fear of uh, of what may happen one day, may or may not happen one day. That actually is a very school way of thinking also, because school forces teaching on children in case they need it someday. All these things, all these subjects, all these grades you have to go through, all these years is in case you need it someday. When, as we all know, you forget it the minute the test is over, unless it's something you're really interested in. So that's just not a necessary of necessary in our lives at all. Life is what's happening right now, right in this moment, and that's our focus. We have no idea what tomorrow brings. So why try to prepare for something that may never happen? When you live in a mind unschooling mindset, there's not only a deep trust in the children learning from doing whatever it is they love to do, but there's a deep trust in the fact that no matter what life brings to us, we'll be able to walk through it together and figure it out as it comes along. Because that's what we've been doing. That's what we learned from our experiences from yesterday and last month and everything else. It's everything we've collected along the path of our lives where our children have had needs and desires and challenges and joys. And we've always walked through them together as a deeply connected family. And I, I just want to say one last thing My, with my always unschooled adult children being ages 23 and 27, I'm able to back up and see the bigger picture, which is really cool. I get to see this beautiful tapestry that we wove together with all of our lives. And what I want to share about that is this. These things that new unschoolers tend to worry about that the child is not reading or writing or drawing or is not good at math. These things are such small, minuscule, microscopic threads in this huge, vast, glorious tapestry of life that we've created together. The bigger picture will show you that the energy that's being used in worry and fear could have been used toward joy and creating your beautiful, sacred space that allowed your children to shine and feel safe and free ex to be exactly who they are and free to do that which they love to do because there already will be challenges in your lives and that's life. Challenges will arise. And so these fears and worries that parents tend to manufacture that come from a school perspective, honestly, they won't even matter because the challenges that our children will face simply from growing and stretching and becoming more of who they are, you know, these are the things that will require our life's energy and our creativity and our uh, the thing that will get us through those times is the fact that for all of the other moments of our lives together, we have built this incredible foundation of joy and love and connection with each other. And most of all, trust, trust in each other and in our lives. Pam? That was a great reminder <laughs> to pull it up and, and just to see with that longer term perspective, you know, mm -hmm. that that the energy, our energy that we put into fears and worries, you know, if we can make that shift to use that energy to connect and find joy in that moment, in, in that day with our kids, it's uh it just gives so many more rewards moving forward, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so there were, I, I thought I'd share just a couple of things that I've done when my kids were feeling a bit frustrated, maybe feeling behind in something. Um, but I want to say really, 
what might help is, is very individual and personal to the child. So, you know, the things I share aren't a universal answer. I'm not saying go off and do these things, but they're just some ideas um, that might spark something for you. Um, so uh, over the years, I have mentioned to them when yeah, that's the other nice thing about having all this time, right, is that um, when something comes up, uh, a fear of theirs or of ours, it we always feel like we need to solve it so quickly, right? But we have this time. These moments bubble up. These things will come up in conversations, in moments. Um, we don't need to force a moment. You know what I mean? Um, that's why he, the big thing for family meetings and stuff never never worked for us because that, that puts everybody... Um, like on the defensive to start with, but it's not a natural flow. And uh, when it comes up in the flow, these are when um, people are more willing uh, to share uh, information. They're ready for the conversation. The converse, the things that you share with them will connect with them because that's where they are in that moment. You know, we're most helpful and supportive when we're with them where they are in that moment, right? You join them where they are. And if I think I have something interesting to share, more often than not, I'm gonna wait to, until a moment shows up where that has value and connection in that moment. Not pull them out of what they're doing and say, hey, I just had this thought about this other thing that you mentioned three days ago. <laughs> you know, uh, being in the flow and being with them is always the best place for, for these conversations. But anyway, so over the years, I have mentioned how people learn things at different rates and at, at different times. Um, I remember when one of my kids was feeling frustrated about not reading well yet, while his cousin, who was close to him in age, was, right? So we were hanging out. I, I'm sure. And uh, when we came home, he he probably mentioned it to me there. So, you know, because they went to school. Um, so I think he was starting to worry, you know, it, is that something I need to go to school for to learn how to read? Uh, but then again, soon after when we saw them, they came to visit us. Uh, we were all playing Monopoly together. And I noticed that he was faster with the numbers than she was, right? Adding up the dice, handling the money, etc. So later that day when we were chatting, I mentioned it to him in passing. Did he notice? And it was just an example of how I told him, you know, look, you pick, you pick up numbers pretty fast. She picked up reading pretty fast. Neither one is better than the other. Just different. You know, we're all individuals. It was just a nice little example. Um, and I shared it with him. And it has taken me longer to explain it to you here than it did at the time in conversation with him. <laughs> Cause you just put it out and you just, you saw like the little light bulb, the little connection. And we went on about our business. Um, but knowing that he was, it was something that he was frustrated and he was thinking about, I was extra on the lookout for things um, that happened around us that were related and that I could mention, point out without making a big deal about it, but just giving him more fodder for the connections that he was making, um, depending on how he was seeing the situation, right? And uh, as the questioner mentioned, I would tell them not to worry about it, that I was confident that they'd figure out whatever it was. Um, but I'd also offer to help them be more proactive about it if they wanted, right? It wasn't, um, I'm going to say, not worry and then leave you alone. And sometimes they would want me to be more proactive with them, help them out. So I remember there was one time uh, I was with Michael and we wrote out some words that he wanted to know how to read, along with ones that he already knew on some post-it notes. Um, we did a little bit of like flashcard-like games and, and then I would arrange them in funny sentences for him to figure out, stuff like that. And I'd be on the lookout for ways that we could play with words a bit more actively during the day. But it was important not to expect him to do it or to pressure him, you know, not to go up to him and say, hey, you said you wanted to learn to read. So come on, let's go do those post-it notes, those flashcards that we had. No, because that can trigger resistance um, and that will literally make it harder for them to to learn whatever it is they're interested in because they're not in that moment. You're trying to pull them into that moment. 
right? That's the difference. And I think maybe that lasted for a week and we had fun. We kind of did it before we went to bed. Hey, this is this. I would make up funny sentences. He'd laugh. And it was a great connecting time. Remember, we're always talking about those connections and making those connections. And if there's something, some skill, some information that they're interested in at the time, make connections for them with them around that but no expectations in it because um, that breaks the connection. So in this particular question, uh, you know, uh, what is your daughter trying to do with multiplication? Um, and don't ask her, you know, you don't need to uh, directly say, well, what is it that you want? Um, you can observe, you can see when does she bring that up? What's going on around her when she brings that up? What What are the situations where she says she's feeling embarrassed? What was happening at that time? Um, does she have a calculator or a phone handy to figure out the answer in the moment and move on? You know, maybe she's in a particular situation where they need to uh, do some calculations. Oh, just make sure she has her phone at that time. Uh, the whole memorization thing about around multiplication is it really isn't a big deal anymore. Or is she maybe looking for a quickie explanation of what multiplication actually means, what it does? So maybe you could give her a super quick, easy demonstration, you know, of three groups of five things on a table. Um, and in 10 seconds or less, just show her how that works. So here's how we add it up. And here's uh, what the multiplication sentence looks like around that particular fact, maybe making it concrete might help. Maybe you'll find a funny video online that explains it and just send her the link, you know, especially when you're first building that trust and connection in the relationship, you don't want to be um, hovering over it uh, because that can be interpreted as expectation. So you really want to give them lots of space to choose the way that they might want to approach things. As for the second question, the worry about something happening and them having to go to school, um, I totally get that too. And, but it really is the fears getting in the way. And it, it helps to remember that there are older kids in school who aren't reading well either. Again, it's, it's not the same with handwriting, you know. These are skills that people, kids pick up over time at, at a different set, different rate. And um, the, the, it's only a problem, like you said, like in school, but there's still a range. Not all the kids are reading by a certain grade, et cetera. So it's not going to be a shock to the teachers if that's what you're worried about. And really, if we uh, keep ruminating on those fears um, and we start going down that path, where would it end, right? We could use that excuse to subject our kids to all sorts of things that we would do in the name of getting them to fit in and toughen up just in case. And we would lose that connected and trusting relationship that we are building with them and the lifestyle that we've chosen and that we believe will serve them better today and in the long run. So, you know, if you just kind of step it a little bit further and further, you realize, well, geez, that's not a road or a path that I want to start going down. So I, I know when I struggle with that question, I just did my best at the moment to choose a reasonable guardian, let them know about alternative schools that were nearby that I thought might be a better fit for my kids in public school. And then I just got on with my unschooling days. Anna? Yeah. Okay. Um, I found for question one, you know, I found over the years that there's really an ebb and flow to those feelings. And because of the depths that of which my girls go into their interests, there are just as many or more times where they know things that schooled kids or school at home kids don't know because of this time that they have to explore the things that they're interested in. You know, we all bring different gifts and interests to the table. And I I personally feel that we're far better served as a society by people digging in and sharing what they love as opposed to all becoming kind of mediocre at the same subjects. So helping your child find what she shine, where she shines and find and explore what brings her joy will help her have things to share and celebrate with her friends. And that will become connecting opportunities for her with her friends. Um, regarding question two, 
I try really hard not to make decisions out of fear. And I think it's a really fast way to lose track of ourselves. So I keep, just like Anne was talking about, keep my focus on today and on creating the best life that we can right now. And that foundation gives us the strength and skills to face whatever comes our way. And just like Anne mentioned, I mean, we have seen this over and over again, that our foundation and our connection, when things have happened, tragic things, difficult things, we we we're ready. We have the foundation. We have the connection. We have the skills and the ability to move through whatever those things are, even when they're big and scary. Um, and as Pam said, there are plenty of people in school that don't read well or don't do well in math. And I think the idea that everyone in school knows everything might be tripping you up a little bit. And it really just isn't true. So the gift of connecting as a family, living your best lives right now is the greatest gift that you can give them really give each other okay <laughs> I love that you know uh that point about um our kids know unschooling kids knowing so many different yeah. things than school kids do I think that's awesome and and as Anne was saying you know bringing that to the table so that she has ways to shine in those situations mm-hmm. with with those other kids and the other piece is that when our kids dive into their interests that is when the really cool like these are ba- these when we talk about the basic skills, you know, reading and math and all that kind of stuff, they are all part of of life as we've talked about. But as they're diving into their interests, that's when they're going to passionately find a reason for wanting to yes. be able to they're going to find value in those skills. There we go. It's not learning to read. It's not learning to do math or multiplication. They're going to come across a moment when those skills have value in the pursuit of the thing that they in, love in their real lives and not in not their some real arbitra- lives. Ar- ar- somebody say that word for me. My mouth isn't working. Arbitrary. <laughs> Thank you. It's <laughs> cool manufacturers. So yeah, it's, it's all about their real lives that I wasn't around uh, 24 hours a day to read Jacob, the first Harry Potter book. And so he picked it up and it was the first book he ever read that he, when he would learn to read. So, you know, that's, uh, it's, that's life. And when they are wanting something, we help them get it. And that's when it happens. And I think something Anne shared before fits here too, it's the briefing debriefing piece, because I think if, if like Pam said too, talk to her about kind of what's happening in those moments and maybe there's ways to just have that. Okay. So maybe this child is sharing her math work that she had to do because it's a school to home environment. And, you know, she can say, Oh, interesting. You know, I haven't looked at it that way. Here's what I've been doing this week. I've been, you know, looking about photography and I took these cool pictures. Do you want to see them? You know, and just, help her have some words around sharing what she's been doing and enjoying versus kind of be and, and just accepting that this is what this child's been doing and really I think what we found over and over again is those kids were quick to leave behind the worth ma- the math workbook they were talking about to really talk about what we were doing because it was usually very interesting you know whatever that new hobby or passion was right well the, my perspective and my answer came from our experience where um, kids found out that my kids didn't go to school so then they started testing them and mm-hmm. uh, you know and that's uh, that's where I came from you know if, if that's what's happening do you really want to be around these people and everything exactly but then again, like uh, if they tested my kids, I've always told them to just ask them what the answer to the question was and then say, well, I didn't have to be in school for 12 years to learn that. I just learned that from you telling me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and the other thing that I'm wondering Dreaming. about if if kids go to school, OK, with our homeschooling lives, we have to do homeschooling reports in New York. And I don't know if you don't do them right. Do they force kids to go to school? Maybe. But in school, if kids fail, do they kick the kids out of school? So there you go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Kind of. And that's the last question for this month. Uh, thank you both so much for answering questions thank with me. You. And just thank you very much. And just a reminder to listeners, there are links in the show notes for everything that we've mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you'd like to submit a question for the next Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Thanks very much and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the third book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Life Through the Lens of Unschooling. This book is a wide array of essays drawn from my blog that shed light on the day-to-day lives of unschooling families. You'll find essays tackling everything from learning to read to visiting relatives, all organized around nine keywords that have been woven into the fabric of our unschooling lives. De-schooling, learning, days, parenting, relationships, family, lifestyle, unconventional, and perspective. The theme is life, the lens, unschooling. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.